Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the spotlight presentation called Wouldn't It Be Nace? Protecting Final Control Elements in Corrosive Applications. My name is Dave Macedonia. I work in business development for Emerson's Pressure Management Business Unit based in McKinney, Texas. I've been with Emerson for five years and prior to Emerson, I've spent seven years working in operations and maintenance of naval nuclear plants. Joining me today is Ali Babkar, metallurgist who also works in McKinney in the Pressure Management Business Unit. And thanks for turning in today uh, to learn a little bit more about corrosion of final control elements. So our agenda for today, first I'll be going through some corrosion basics and effects. Next, I'll be talking about shifts that we're seeing in the oil and gas industry today. Then we'll talk a little bit about corrosion mechanisms. And finally, we'll talk about industry standards for corrosion and material selection. So corrosion basics and effects. First of all, what is corrosion? The short answer is that it's a naturally occurring phenomenon in which a material deteriorates as a result of chemical or electrochemical reaction with its environment. The Latin root of the word corrosion is corrodere, which means to gnaw. That's a very apropos description of what actually is happening. A prerequisite for corrosion to occur is a low resistance environment, conductive, uninterrupted contact between two areas on a metal surface. So it can, it can be adjacent or far apart or between two different metals with established uh, potential difference. So this can happen with the same metal due to micro metallurgical differences between them, or with two different metals with different electrochemical potentials. So on the bottom of the screen, you can see a common form of corrosion where ions flow from the anode to the cathode due to an electrochemical potential between the two. It's done within an, an electrolyte. As a result, oxidation occurs at the cathode and metal loss occurs in the anode. The rate of corrosion is controlled by a presence of process oxidants and or contaminants. So corrosion types. The American Petroleum Institute details more than 25 different corrosion mechanisms in API 571, uh, but these are divided into three major categories. So these categories are divided by severity, method, and ease of detection. So group three is what we're gonna primarily focus on here, and the corrosion methods in this group require a microscope to detect. So why is corrosion a big deal? Corrosion presents operators with a variety of risks that need to be addressed. So first, safety concerns. Corrosion can compromise the integrity of pressure boundaries, and it's actually the number one cause of tier one and tier two safety incidents, according to the American fuel and petrochemical manufacturers. A related risk is loss of containment. This can result in lost product. It can also involve safety hazards for personnel and equipment as well as environmental effects. Also, maintenance and repair costs. Corrosion is a glutton of maintenance budgets. When corrective maintenance is needed, these costs multiply. And then finally, downtime. Corrosion can cause unplanned outages, and it can also cause delays in starting up after a planned outage. The costs of downtime in the industry are very steep. So one recent extreme example of the effects of corrosion was at the Philadelphia Energy Solutions Refinery in June of 2019. So at this site, a corroded pipe elbow and alkylation unit resulted in a loss of containment, which released propane, flammable vapors, and hydrofluoric acid to the atmosphere. The vapors ignited, causing a fire and multiple explosions. The fire actually burned for 28 hours. And thankfully, no one was killed, but it released a, a large amount of toxic hydrofluoric acid to the environment, which caused a health risk to a major metropolitan area. As a result, the refinery actually filed for bankruptcy and has been closed ever since. So economic impacts. So even without a major event, the economic costs of corrosion can be significant. In a study by the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, the global cost of corrosion across all industries is about $1.5 trillion. Most of this impact is in the industrial space. While the impact in the US is significant, it's actually not as severe as that of the Middle East or in Europe where sour gas is more prevalent. So let's talk more about corrosive process media in oil and gas and how the industry is shifting. So first of all, what does sour mean? For gas, greater than four parts per million of hydrogen sulfide qualifies as sour, and sour crude contains more than 0.5% of sulfur. The problem in the industry is that sour gas and oil are present across the world. According to the International Energy Agency, over 40% of the world's gas reserves are sour. To continue to pr produce and process, oil and gas to be sold into global markets, producers need special material for their equipment. 
One such example of a sour project is the Shaw Field in the United Arab Emirates, where production is, is subject to highly corrosive process conditions containing high levels of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. So here we go a little level deeper to show a few examples of how sour oil and gas are across the world. In North America, you can find sour crudes in Alaska, Alberta, and the Gulf of Mexico. In overseas plays, you can find sour gas in Russia and the Middle East. Especially as oil and gas become harder to find, E&P companies will need to tap into sour reserves and mitigate the risks that come with corrosive process media. And now we'll shift gears and talk about corrosion mechanisms. Different molecules mixed in water can yield corrosion in various forms. These mechanisms manifest themselves in different ways and each presents different risks. So I mentioned previously that stress corrosion cracking and hydrogen burnment are two types of corrosion which cannot be detected with the naked eye. So here are a few examples, each on a microscopic level, including their magnification. Ali actually took these photos in our lab in McKinney. So what components are we most worried about when it comes to corrosion? The most problematic components are directly wetted by corrosive process fluid, especially in low flow areas. I won't go too far in depth here, but I've listed examples of equipment across the value chain where corrosion is most prevalent. As it pertains to final control elements, examples of parts which may be susceptible to corrosive process fluid include bodies, welds, fasteners, internal trim parts, and others. Now moving on to industry standards. So what is the industry doing about it? The most active group in this area is the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, or NACE. They're widely accepted as the premier experts in the field of corrosion science, and they've written standards to provide guidance to users in both the upstream and the downstream parts of the oil and gas value chain. So the upstream standard, known as MR0175, was developed in 1975. 01 is the version, and 75 is the initial year of publication. Over the years, NACE has published a few revisions to the standard and until, until 2009, when they partnered with the International Standards Organization, or ISO, to perform NACE MR075 ISO 15156, or commonly referred to as NACE ISO. Uh, this standard is now the benchmark for corrosion mitigation in oil and gas. Although there's a separate NACE standard specific to downstream, many customers in this space actually default to NACE ISO. So the standard itself is divided into three different parts. So one, general principles, two, carbon and low alloy steels, and three, corrosion resistant alloys. It also includes a table to detail specific equipment that the standard applies to and permitted exclusions for specific equipment. The NACE ISO standard does have several differences from the, the 2002 version of NACE MR0175, which is still used by some users today. Without going into some details, um, some of the biggest differences include additional guidance on welding, the acceptability of specific stainless steel alloys, more detail about high nickel alloys, which are common in the industry, and bolting. The standard also outlines responsibilities for both users and suppliers, something that's important to understand. The end user is ultimately responsible to select materials suitable to the application. There's a misconception that the vendor is responsible for doing this if the customer asks for a NACE compliant construction, but this is not the case. The vendor can advise the customer on material selection, but the final decision ultimately resides with the end user. The vendor is responsible to ensure the material that they deliver is what the end user actually specified. The standard is very clear on this topic. There's actually a disclaimer at the beginning of each of the three sections in bold type defining the responsibility of the equipment user for material selection. I've actually transcribed it here on the screen. Moving on to material selection. So material selection will greatly depend on the application and the stakeholders involved. When selecting any material, the process conditions must be taken into account and that the system is designed to withstand the worst case operating conditions with a safety factor applied. Sometimes chemical analysis, lab testing, or risk analysis may be required. Uh, but there also might be multiple materials suitable for the same application, but those materials may vary in cost and availability. Our inside sales engineers at Emerson are well aware of these requirements and can help our customers and channel partners navigate this process. 
So I just mentioned that process conditions always matter when selecting a material. There are several factors which can make the process conditions worse and require a different material. So NACE ISO the standard has a graph which shows four distinct regions of stress corrosion cracking which may require different alloys for corrosion resistance. So the x-axis shows a partial pressure of hydrogen sulfide and the y-axis with pH. And both of those axes are logarithmic. So a few things to point out here. Below the point of 0.3 kilopascals of hydrogen sulfide, the process media is not in any stress corrosion cracking region, regardless of the pH. But above this level of hydrogen sulfide, the combination of sulfur and the acidity of the process media will change the risk of stress corrosion cracking. The NACE ISO standard provides material guidance for each of these regions. So what are our options? I have four examples here of alloys used in various applications for corrosion resistance. So Monel, Inconel, and Hastelloy C are high nickel alloys which are commonly used in corrosive applications in oil and gas. Nickel, aluminum, bronze is commonly used in deep water platforms due to its resistance from, to, to corrosion from seawater. The material composition of these alloys gives them different properties which are more or less desirable given the application. Additionally, higher concentrations of certain elements will make an alloy more expensive. For the purposes of our discussion here, we're going to focus on a few elements in the composition of these alloys. So first, nickel. Nickel adds corrosion resistance and stability. The alloys shown, with the exception of aluminum bronze on the bottom, are high nickel alloys. Two is chromium. So chromium adds to corrosion resistance in high temperature environments. Three, molybdenum. Molybdenum adds resistance to sulfur, which is ideal for sour applications. And finally, iron. Iron adds strength and lowers cost of the alloy. So to go a bit deeper, I have examples of three high nickel alloys here on the screen. Incaloy 825, Incanel 625, and alloy C276, known as Hastelloy C. The graphs show corrosion resistance in three dimensions. Hydrogen sulfide concentration, carbon dioxide concentration, and temperature. The three alloys have a different mix of nickel, chromium, and molybdenum, which change the corrosion resistance across these dimensions. From left to right, the amount of test data increases because the alloys are more or less common. While all of these alloys have good corrosion resistance in corrosive environments, Hastelloy C actually performs the best in sour applications because of its concentration of molybdenum. From the ISO corrosion charts here on the screen, you can see the comparison between Inconel 625 and Hastelloy C. In the same concentration of sulfuric acid, Hastelloy C corrodes at the same rate as, as Inconel, but at a higher temperature. And this is not to point out that Inconel isn't a great material choice. It is. But when selecting the right material for a corrosive environment, there are many factors to consider, including acidity, sulfur content, contaminants, and temperature, among others. Process conditions, along with cost, should be taken into consideration to select the right material for the job. So I'll close by talking about two other areas where Emerson can help mitigate corrosion risks. So first, we can perform corrosion testing in our McKinney lab upon request. Now, this is our spalt spray test chamber. And as an example, we, we tested an industrial product, the Fisher MR95 pressure regulator which is commonly used in oil and gas applications. So on the left is a WCC steel unit with a coating, and on the right is the same unit, but only in CF8M stainless steel. And this picture was taken after 1,000 hours of salt spray testing. So these photos speak for themselves to illustrate how important material selection is in corrosive environments. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't give a plug to Emerson's corrosion monitoring product line in a presentation about corrosion. So for those of you not aware, our Rosemount business within Emerson has a corrosion monitoring system in their portfolio. These products adhere to metallic surfaces with magnets and straps secure them in place. Uh, the device itself is actually an ultrasonic transmitter which continually measures wall thickness. Uh, these devices are easy to install and the batteries can last up to nine years. And lastly, the, the data is, is collected uh, and delivered through wireless heart which can feed into software package to visualize the wall thickness for operators. This equipment can be a great tool for trend analysis of areas that are more susceptible to corrosion, like pipe elbows, and to avoid loss in containment. And also, it can be used to more effectively plan outages to replace portions of, of corroded piping. 
If you're interested, you can reach out to your local Rosemount sales rep to learn more.